This morning, our gospel scripture reading comes to us from the gospel according to Luke. I invite you now to listen closely for God's word to us. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and most gracious God, we trust all things to you at all times. And so we come now before you, praying that you would speak to us again. Praying that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts might be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In early June, a public art project entitled Unity occupied an open field in the Del Rey neighborhood of Alexandria. The project consisted of 32 poles arranged in a circle, each with an identifier such as, I'm a parent, I'm a student, I own a home, I don't have a home, I consider myself a Republican, I consider myself a Democrat, I don't consider myself to have a political affiliation, and the list went on. Participants were invited to take yarn from a center pole and tie the yarn around each pole with which they identified. Over the eight days of the project, More than 1,500 people participated, stringing nearly 37 miles of bright pink, orange, and red yarn, forming a canopy of crisscrossing strands, each telling part of a person's story. Nancy Belmont, who organized the project, said that part of the fun was seeing people tripping over each other, bumping into each other as their lines crossed. Power in a simple shared action. The final art project also had a powerful visual effect. The organizer described it this way. When you look at unity from far away, it's this massive structure. 
But when you start to go in and look under the canopy, you see the single strings and realize they're each a person. And then you step back a bit and you start to see who a lot of people are. And then you step back even more and you start to see humanity. And you see that even though we have different experiences and we all identify in different ways and think in different ways, we are really one. A relatively simple public art project created from yarn to help a neighborhood see their shared humanity, to help reorient a community. For the organizer, it was a response to what she describes as the divisiveness and negative rhetoric in American politics. She describes herself as just another person from the neighborhood, a mom who wanted to do something. Her hope was to raise consciousness about the labels we give ourselves and others and explore how those labels both support and limit community. She wanted to reorient people's perspectives so that they could see that we are all connected by something. And it's our diversity that builds a strong and vibrant community. Nancy Belmont saw the world coming apart a bit. She saw the frayed edges of community and unity. A public art project was the little bit she felt she could do to start the process of mending. The world coming apart a bit. Frayed community. We've seen it too. We know the feeling. Sometimes it's very personal. We see a close friend or family member struggling with illness or depression or addiction. We feel helpless to do anything. We feel completely out of control. Or a loved one dies, and suddenly our world is entirely different. Or a dear friend moves, and all we can see is the space that person left. We don't know quite where to turn or what to do. And then... Sometimes that coming apart feeling is bigger. It's more pervasive. Recently, it's been the daily news. Sandwiched between two political conventions. It's true. The political rhetoric is increasingly divisive on all sides of this election season. And we weep. And we weep and we will lament, as I shared in my email earlier this week, at the violent injustice and hate which is ripping apart communities near and far just in the last few days. You can add Munich and Kabul to the places in our world where it seems the world is coming apart. That feeling of unraveling, of community frayed. It's a feeling we all know. And it's a feeling that can easily leave us paralyzed, can easily make us feel overwhelmed or captive to fear and despair. It's hard to know what to do or where to begin. It's hard to even imagine how our actions, anything we could do, could make a difference in the face of such brokenness. But that's where Christ comes in. That's where Christ's example and Christ's teaching come in. Prayer. Jesus models for us and teaches us to pray. Today, when we read Luke's Gospel, we find Jesus in prayer. Jesus often took time apart to pray. He was always encountering people experiencing loss, struggling with illness. 
people pushed aside by society, people enmeshed in ugly politics. And Jesus was always taking time to pray. When Jesus finishes his time of prayer, the disciples ask him to teach them to pray. Jesus responds with simple and direct instructions. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Often, prayer has been described as a time to talk to God, asking God for what we want or need, what Anne Lamont calls a gimme prayer. We should ask, and God will answer. We tend to lean on Jesus' later instructions, ask, and you will receive, without first sinking into his very specific words for prayer, words which we now know as the Lord's Prayer. The prayer Jesus taught is a compass, orientating us in the direction we should go. Jesus teaches us to pray, saying, Father, hallowed be your name, so that our hearts might be orientated always toward God Jesus teaches us to pray, saying, Your kingdom come, so that our minds might be fixed on God's will and not our own. As we've heard it said many times from this pulpit, when we pray, Your kingdom come, we must also pray, My kingdom, our kingdom, go. Jesus teaches us to pray, saying, Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, and do not bring us into the time of trial, so that our whole lives might be orientated toward the needs, the reconciliation, and the well-being of the entire community. Jesus doesn't say, Give me my bread, forgive my sins, Do not lead me into the time of trial. Rather, it's our bread. It's our sins in need of forgiveness. And it's all of us that need not be in the time of trial. It's about community. Even that ask, and it will be given you a bit later on that we love so much, It's not a singular ask, nor a singular receive. The original Greek is far more clear. It's better translated by relying on a good southern y'all. Y'all ask, and it will be given to y'all. Y'all search, and y'all find. Y'all knock, and the door will be open for y'all. And Marshall, how to do? Jesus teaches the disciples, teaches us to pray using simple words that keep us orientated toward community, toward our shared needs, toward our shared need of forgiveness, and toward our collective well-being. And as we say the words again and again and again, as we persevere in prayer, we are constantly orientated toward God toward God's kingdom, God's will, and toward the needs of our community. And given this congregation's strong tradition of praying for one another, it will be no shock to all of you that it's not just the words of the prayer that orientate us in the way we should go. It's the very act of praying together that binds us up as a community as well. Just as there is power in the shared act of a public art project of yarn, there is, pro- there is power, great power, in the simple shared act of prayer. 
and praying together and saying and hearing the words of prayer, many voices lifted up together. We feel the power of the Holy Spirit around us. We are reminded that we are not alone, that our prayer is one of many, a shared prayer, a shared desire for a world where wholeness and goodness are known by all. Slaves sang together in prayer to sustain their spirits. Likewise, prayer was a pillar of the civil rights movement. Before marches, people prayed together. Before sit-ins, people prayed together. Before the Montgomery bus boycott, people prayed together. There is strength and there is power in praying together. The shared act of prayer changes us, not God, but us. We begin to see differently and to see where God is at work and how we can participate in that work. We begin to see where little actions can make a big difference and start an unknown chain of dominoes in prayer A heart is stirred to call that friend who is also struggling, and there we find strength in common experiences and wisdom from one another's journey. In prayer, hearts, many hearts, are stirred to research something as simple and yet complex as cultural differences, and we are better equipped to reach out and engage one another with sensitivity, generosity, and love, and to educate others to do likewise. In our very own congregation, in prayer, hearts were stirred to begin this congregation's prayer shawl ministry, and just in the last couple of weeks, prayer and warmth in the form of handmade shawls made their way all the way to France to envelop a beloved dying mother. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. When we say the words again and again and again, praying together, we begin to see and hear God pointing us out, pointing, showing us the very small things to us, but the things we can do to move toward the world as God intends. What those little things are will be different for each of us. For some, it's an act of volunteer service. For others, an act of advocacy. For others, it's monetary giving. For still others, it's baking. And for others, it's the act of self-education to prepare for future action. We pray the words again and again. Together, they become written on our hearts, and they become an answer to that feeling of unraveling, of coming apart, of community fraying. They orientate us toward God and the good news that God gives abundantly. They orientate us toward the promise that when we all ask, we all will receive. God gives abundantly to God's beloved people to provide for all our needs. And God gives the Holy Spirit to equip and empower us to make sure that abundance, that sustenance, that forgiveness, that well-being is shared with all. We all know that feeling. That feeling that the world is coming apart, that our community is somehow unraveling a bit. And it's easy to be paralyzed by the power of that feeling or the pervasiveness of the realities that foster that feeling. But we need not be. 
Perhaps you've heard it said, Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. I would add, do not be daunted by the feeling that the world is coming apart. Pray now. You're not, you are not obligated to solve the problem alone, but neither are you allowed to abandon the first act of prayer or to abandon the little things to which God calls you as we pray together.